In the late 1960s, on nighttime streets and makeshift drag strips across America, many racers began encountering a strange phenomenon. The first run was always perfect. The V8 roared, the rear tires painted rubber on the pavement, the tack needle climbed straight up. But after stopping for about 10 minutes, with the hood still closed and heat quietly building, when the throttle was hit again, the car suddenly went soft, not stalling, not popping or coughing, just down on power. Some blamed bad gasoline, others swore it was vapor lock. But the truth was far more uncomfortable. The engine hadn't lost power at all. Air and fuel were the ones that betrayed you. And the solution? Not a bigger cam, not an expensive carburetor. Just a thin spacer, costing about $6. The piece that quietly turned heat-soaked V8s into stable, repeatable monsters. The irony is that most engines suffering from soft power after heat soak are not short on fuel at all. The fuel pump still has adequate pressure, the carburetor boosters are opening through their proper range, and the CFM numbers on paper show nothing wrong. The problem lies elsewhere, in how the air-fuel mixture moves, not in how much of it there is. Picture what's happening inside the intake manifold. At high RPM, the air-fuel mixture is pulled through the carb throat, plunges into the plenum, then is forced to make an abrupt turn to enter the runners. When the engine is still cool, most of the fuel remains a fine mist, light enough to follow the air. But once the entire mass of metal has heat-soaked, the story changes. Heat causes fuel particles to lose their ability to stay suspended. The fine mist begins to coalesce into heavier liquid droplets. And when the airflow changes direction suddenly in the plenum, those droplets can't turn with it. They slam straight into the floor of the intake, stick there, then get pulled randomly into different runners. The result is a quiet disaster. One cylinder gets an overly rich mixture, the next runs lean. The AFR gauge in the exhaust reads, fine, but inside the engine, the picture is badly skewed. Some cylinders run too hot, others are simply weak. The engine doesn't explode, it just loses power in a way that's hard to explain. This is where the philosophy of Smokey Eunuch becomes frighteningly accurate. He once said, in essence, fuel doesn't care about your charts or your theory. If you throw it at a wall, it will behave like a mass. From the outside, a carburetor spacer looks like nothing more than an inert gasket sitting between the carb and the intake. But in reality, it acts simultaneously on three core factors that determine how an engine behaves. Distance, volume, and temperature. First is distance. Raising the carb by one to two inches isn't about creating instant power, but about buying time for the air-fuel mixture. At 6,000 RPM, fuel leaving the booster is immediately forced to change direction in the plenum. The spacer lengthens that path, allowing fuel droplets to remain suspended longer and reducing their impact with the intake floor. The result is smoother flow, less turbulence, especially once the engine has heat-soaked. Next is volume. A spacer increases the effective plenum volume by a few percent. On small block Chevy engines, this typically shifts peak torque upward by about 200 to 300 RPM. Not because the engine is stronger, but because a larger plenum acts as a buffer, softening the intake pulses from each cylinder. The engine breathes more evenly and throttle response stays smoother as RPM climbs. Finally, and most often underestimated, is temperature. Spacers made from phenolic or polycarbonate function as effective thermal barriers, reducing by dozens of degrees Fahrenheit the heat transferred from the intake to the carb. Fuel in the float bowls stays more stable. Vaporization is reduced, and AFR during hot restarts 
no longer drifts. The engine fires cleanly after a wait, without hesitation, without stumbling. Not all spacers are created to do the same job. On the surface, they differ only by a few drilled holes or slight changes in internal shape. But on classic V8 engines, especially those running big cams and high RPM, those differences completely change airflow behavior and, in turn, the entire character of the engine. Start with the most familiar type, the four-hole spacer. True to its name, it preserves four separate intake paths aligned directly with the carb bores. This design increases the velocity of the air-fuel mixture while strengthening the booster signal. On intake manifolds with runners, roughly 8 to 10 inches long, especially in street applications, a four-hole spacer often delivers better low and mid-range torque. Initial throttle is firm, response is quick, and the engine feels tight and easy to control. But the four-hole spacer has very clear limits. When an engine runs a camshaft with large valve overlap, typically exceeding 220 to 230 degrees at 0 0.050, pressure waves in the intake become chaotic. Under those conditions, the four-hole spacer tends to worsen fuel separation. The runners begin to fight for mixture and cylinder-to-cylinder -cylinder imbalance returns, especially at higher RPM. The complete opposite is the open spacer. This type merges all four intake paths into a single shared space, effectively turning the entire area above the intake into a larger plenum. The primary benefit here is increased intake volume, typically about 8 to 15 percent, depending on spacer thickness. Above 5,500 RPM, an open spacer often adds 5 to 10 horsepower, not because it forces more air in, but because it allows the cylinders to share supply more efficiently. Open spacers are particularly well suited to high RPM engines, drag strip cars, or combinations where peak horsepower matters more than initial throttle response. The trade-off is that low RPM throttle response can become softer, especially on heavier street cars. Once again, this isn't about good or bad, it's about right or wrong for the intended use. Then there's a spacer that borders on legend, the tapered spacer, once considered a secret weapon in professional racing. It emerged when NASCAR began tightening regulations on carburetor size. No larger bores, no carb swaps, engineers had to find another path. The answer was geometry. A tapered spacer features inward sloping walls that act like a diffuser. Instead of forcing airflow to accelerate sharply, it slows the stream in a controlled way, helping fuel remain suspended longer. On the flow bench, a two-inch tapered spacer placed under a Holley 450 Dominator showed an increase of more than 130 CFM without changing the cam or the carb. On the track, that effectiveness wasn't just about peak power, but about high RPM stability when the engine is punished continuously under extreme heat. And precisely because of that effectiveness, the tapered spacer was quickly banned by NASCAR for a reason everyone recognized. Geometry that bypassed the rules. In the test laboratories of General Motors in the late 1960s, engines were measured under a very clean procedure. The engine was cold, temperatures were controlled, and it was run once to capture the best possible numbers. Peak horsepower, peak torque. Those figures later appeared in brochures, advertisements, and specification sheets. On paper, everything looked perfect. But out there, on drag strips and city streets, reality was completely different. Racers like Bill Jenkins didn't care how powerful an engine was in a single run. What they chased was repeatability. They ran again and again, 
letting the engine heat up, shutting it down, waiting, then running it once more. Not to find the peak, but to find the point where the engine started to lie. And it was in those tests that the spacer revealed its value. It didn't dramatically raise peak numbers, but it kept the engine stable from pass to pass. AFR drifted less, throttle response stayed consistent, and elapsed times didn't fall off after a hot soak. So why did GM ignore it? The answer was technical politics. Acknowledging that the spacer worked meant admitting that the geometry of their production intake manifolds had limits. A hard thing to accept when you're selling millions of cars. In the world of mass production, a design that's good enough on paper often beats a solution that's right in the real world. This confrontation wasn't about right versus wrong, but about two different ways of measuring. One side measured peak output under ideal conditions, the other measured engine behavior under heat, time, and real-world abuse. And the spacer, cheap but honest, stood with the latter. Stepping into the 1980s, General Motors entered a new era with a very big promise. EFI would put an end to all fuel distribution problems. Computers, sensors, lookup tables, all were promoted as the final solution to the inherent shortcomings of the carburetor. In theory, it sounded perfectly reasonable. But when you look deeper into the engineering, especially at the throttle body injection systems GM widely used from roughly 1987 to 1995, the picture is far less glamorous. With airflow in the range of only about 500 to 670 cubic feet per minute, TBI was essentially just an electronic carburetor sitting on top of intake manifolds designed for an earlier era. Two large injectors sprayed fuel above the throttle blades, and everything after that was left to the airflow geometry below. The core problem didn't disappear. The air fuel mixture still had to make sharp turns in the plenum, still suffered from heat soak, inertia, and hot metal surfaces. EFI could precisely measure how much fuel was injected, but it couldn't control where that fuel went after leaving the injector. Adding to that was another uncomfortable truth. The O2 sensor only measures the average of all eight cylinders. One or two cylinders running dangerously lean could be completely hidden, as long as the others were rich enough to make up the numbers. On the diagnostic screen, everything still looked fine. But inside the combustion chambers, the imbalance remained, quietly and persistently. That's why people like Smokey Eunuch were never fully convinced by EFI. His position was clear. EFI fixes fuel metering, but it doesn't fix airflow geometry. If the intake still forces fuel to slam into a wall, then no matter how smart the injectors are, physics will always win. In the end, the biggest lesson from the carburetor spacer isn't about a few extra horsepower, it's about how it forces us to look at engines more honestly. The spacer doesn't hide flaws. On the contrary, it exposes limits that were already built into intake geometry, limits that only reveal themselves when temperature rises, time stretches on, and the engine is forced to repeat its job over and over again. For decades, we've been obsessed with peak horsepower, a pretty number on a cold dyno, a smooth graph, a perfect moment. But engines in the real world don't live in that moment. They live in heat, in inertia, in hot restarts, in tense weights at the starting line. The spacer reminds us that engine behavior is what truly defines the experience. That's where the spacer's core value lies. It isn't magic. It doesn't turn a bad design into a great one. What it does is make the truth clearer. When fuel is given more time, more space, and less heat, the engine becomes consistent. And when an engine is consistent, the driver begins to trust the car.
In the age of technology, from carburetors to EFI, that lesson hasn't changed. You can control fuel quantity with a computer, but you can't negotiate with the physics of airflow. Air still has inertia, fuel still has mass, and geometry is still the foundation of everything. The spacer, therefore, isn't just a cheap $6 speed part. It's a philosophy, a reminder that before chasing numbers, you need to understand what's really happening inside that hot block of metal. If you've ever owned one, worked on one, or simply stood there listening as a classic V8 cooled down after a hard, hot pass, then this story is for you. Hit like if you believe an engine is more than just a dyno number. It's how it behaves in the real world. Subscribe to the channel to keep exploring the hidden technical corners and hard-earned lessons from Detroit's golden era. And if you have your own experience with carb spaces, heat soak, or a small block that lies when it's hot, leave a comment. Let's preserve this knowledge together. See you next time.